Okay, so um, welcome. Lovely to have you all here. Um, obviously, I don't know what age range uh, we're talking about or talking. So um, this is going to cover my experience with my son at primary, but also my experience uh, teaching um, students in the sixth form, but particularly ones who have had SEN um, issues and have come from different backgrounds. So um, I have uploaded my slides. Um, I do have them here, but I think it's going to be impossible to read them like this. But you can follow through if you want to, but they'll be available afterwards. So um, I'm going to talk for roughly half an hour, and then after that, there's question and answer session. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, so I've got a, um, a BA in um, English, Lit, and History of Art. And um, I've also got an MA um, uh, in English Lit as well. Um, I've been teaching for uh, so many years, I don't want to tell you, um, both online in the classroom. So I teach in a sixth form college. Um, it's a special sixth form college. Um, about 60% of our UK students are, have some sort of SEN um, issue. Um, I also teach online with uh, Dream Inspires. Um, uh, and uh, an a, a Oxford Teaching Trust as well. I'm an examiner for History of Art, um, and I've spent many years uh, doing pastoral work, eight years doing pastoral work, uh, four of which was leading the pastoral team, and um, I have specialist training in safeguarding and also in mental health. Um, and I think that's uh, you know, really quite important uh, to think about mental health. Um, I've got three children, and they're very much grown up, and they're now not in the room, but I might be now by my dog who will never grow up. So forgive me if I am. Okay, so let's get on to the thing. So, um, so actually this has been a very useful exercise writing this because I had to think quite hard, you know, I, I had some interesting questions beforehand and somebody was asking you, what to use as the kindling? And I thought, oh, that's a really great question. So I had a good time to reflect on it. So my first thing is why light the fire? You know, why did I use that um, uh, um, phrase? So um, I think what we know about fires is the result of fire is like heat or light or energy, or, you know, I'm sure if you're a physicist or whatever, you can tell me all sorts of different things, the result of it. But the big question is why light it in the first place? Um, in education, we might think of it in terms of, you know, the skills or the knowledge or the exams or our children's future. But after pondering on this, why light the flyer? I thought actually asking yourself that question is going to be one of the most important parts of your home education process. And so I'm going to take you through. Uh, how it worked for me asking those questions uh, and looking back over after all these years and in my current practice now. So why is it the most important thing? Why is the question why the most important thing? If you want to motivate behaviour, I believe you need to do it from the inside out. And I, I see this with my students, I see this with students all the time. Um, so, um, what is the purpose? What is you know, the cause? What is the belief? The child, we must understand why, because they need to feel the need to care. So if you get them to feel the need to care, if that comes from the inside, that is going to be the biggest, uh, that is going to be your kindling, in fact. So what I can't do is I cannot tell you um, your why. I cannot tell you your reasons. You will have to reflect on this. But what I can do is I can tell you mine. And I hope that you can draw from this. What, keep, what motivated me all those years ago when my son was a little chap. Um, and in fact, my, my two daughters are also home educated as well. Um, and, you know, now uh, when I'm teaching... Um, students who have really complicated both for SEN and mental health issues. So this is my why. Mm, in my family, we are all dyslexic. 
to, I'm dyslexic, my children are dyslexic, let's stir in a little bit of dyspraxia. Why don't we add a dose of quite extreme slow processing just for good measure? Uh, if we go to a family gathering, then 70% in the room have some sort of uh, SEN thing would fall under the umbrella. It might be dyslexia, it might dys be dyspraxia, uh, it might be um, Asperger's. So um, it's, it's where I come from, it's how I understand the world and how my family functions um, or not. So that's part of my why. And what I did not want was my children to suffer the terrible time I suffered at school. I had a rubbish time at school. And the reason I had a rubbish time, I, nobody found out I was dyslexic until I was 18. And it was a real struggle. Um, and um, I could see that being replicated. So I love, I really love learning and I love knowledge and I love books and I always have. And I am lucky because that saved me. My brother, who's also dyslexic, he hated all that, that stuff. He hated it. He didn't engage with it at all. And the more he went to school, the worse it got. And his experience of learning and school was so awful and it reverberated through my entire family. He suffered, we suffered. It was a real struggle for everybody. Now, I don't know, some of you may or may not identify with this, but the, you know, this was a, a sort of really lived history, my lived history. So I was absolutely adamant, I'm not gonna let this happen to my kids. This isn't gonna happen. This is not gonna happen to my kids, not gonna happen to my family. So when in the primary years, it was clear that it might happen, right, okay, we're going a different way. <laughs> I'm not gonna sit here and have this happen to us. It's not happening, okay? So history does not have to, repeat itself. We, um, I really wanted my children to passionately love finding out about things and about knowing things and the world and to be engaged. Okay, so this is, this is where I was coming from. So the reflection, so that was easy to write down, so the reflection with someone said about the kindling was, okay, let's take my why to pieces, let's go a little further. So I felt an urgent need to support their learning so they wouldn't struggle as I had. So I had, in primary school, I had, um, no one could quite understand, you know, I was quite articulate, but I was an idiot when you looked at the paper. You know? <laughs> and um, I was told quite clearly, well, you know, you will never get a CSE. I've just aged myself really badly. You know, you won't pass a formal exam at all, go and be a florist or be, you know, something, a useful profession, but you, you won't be, you can't do exams. Um, I, I, I got some fantastic, I was in the remedial group. My book had a big red square on it, which branded me as like in the stupid group. It was totally mortifying. Um, um, so I absolutely did not want my children to have. I was very lucky, I had the, when I was in my teens, I had a speech therapist help me, of all people, and she taught me to, uh, she taught me phonological awareness and um, a sort of phonics, and that's really what saved me and got me able to uh, write. And obviously, you know, uh, I can, I'm, I'm perfectly good at it now, but my goodness, it was a struggle. So I wanted to, I didn't want them to go through that. I wanted to generate a sense of wonder about the world. This was a mother part of my why. And my only ambition for them, and it still is, is I want them to be happy in their own skin. And that might sound really simple, but I don't think it is. I think, I think that is the hardest thing. I think that is the crux of lighting the fire. I think it is the hardest thing. So, um, you know, I don't know if you agree or not, but it, I think it is the hardest thing. I have, we think we have a lot of challenges. So let's go through these things, happy in their own skin. I think it's really hard as a parent. It's hard because you have to let go. It's really difficult. You know, I remember when I was pregnant, somebody said, well, that's the easy bit. And having them is the easy bit. Once you've got them, you will not stop worrying for the rest of your life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, 
that is this you know letting them be who they are is almost it's the hardest thing because you have to let go and your instinct is to to is to worry and to maybe uh, foster and do things and channel and so forth and so sometimes you have to stand back from that that's really difficult what you have to let go of and i can give this as examples in my family you have to let go of my family is musical therefore we're going to do music my family is sporty therefore we're going to do sport my family is wired for maths my family does you know indeed they might <laughs> but does your child <laughs> does your child is that where they're at is that the child you've got it, it might not be you know it might not be because they might be SEN uh, and, and the rest of your children or family aren't um, you know it, it just might not be and so you've got to let go of that you have to let go of oh you're just like your uncle your grandmother your aunt okay that's that's crippling what space does that give your child how can you get them to feel the inside out if already you have put a sort of cast like a sort of you know plaster cast on them of you're like this you're like that and the worst one i think the worst one is you're not as good as your sister or your cousin or your best friend oh they're really good at that they're really good at this that can be very very difficult so my own son uh, his older sister um, is, um, well, he's musically uh, very talented, but she was very obviously so because she was a violinist and she started playing when she was two and a half. Uh, and, you know, she has gone on and done all the stuff and, and, um, uh, and uh, you know, <laughs> she found her own way there, but she's actually next, next year going to do an MA in um, uh, performance science especially specializing in uh, dyslexia dyspraxia and playing the violin and performance so you know it's taken her to an interesting place but you know he had to contend with oh don't you play the violin like your sister don't you do this like your sister oh that is so so difficult so how do you find you know they've got to have space to be happy in their own skin and we have to let go of these things. And if other people in the wider um, you know, family or friends are doing that, you've got to make that precious space because they can't respond from the inside if they have all of these things, building walls around them and they have to be in the same way. And I come at this as well from my pastoral and mental health work with young adults. And I, you know, I have done eight, eight years of it. Um, and I stopped, um, I was exhausted. Um, you know, I think we've all read about mental health and young children. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's very real and it is, it's exhausting dealing with it every day. But the biggest issue that I encountered, and you know, you know, to be fair, this is coming from a more traditional teaching route that these children have had. Although, as I say, many of them with lots of SEN issues, the biggest, uh, uh, problem that I had was some of the, really them burdening uh, under the burden of this idea of not being good enough or not being the right child and that's really painful and that is very very difficult to support um, and it could be not the right child in all sorts of ways or even if the you know you know feeling that implicitly they're not good enough and they might have brought that on uh, you know from all sorts of different sources and and this is what i also know from dealing with the parents i know i absolutely know most parents are absolutely doing their best i think we are all doing our best you know that worry means we are trying to do our best and i have to reassure the parents you know you're doing your best but sometimes and this is my message here, you have to let go a little bit it's not all about being results based but because that society we inhabit that society and it has got more so in the last decade it has really got more so in educational terms you know the reverberation on young people um uh is 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 really massive so you know just coming from that wider perspective one that you might not be engaged in at all especially if you have young children uh you know uh, you, you might not sort of see that excuse me i just have a quick thing uh. Okay, so I'm going to give, I'm going to talk about three examples about lighting the fire. So again, starting with my son, Alistair. 
Um, so um, I'll start with him and then I will also talk about two of the people that I taught at college. Um, and these people actually, you know, <laughs> they couldn't be taught and none of, this, none of the other tutors could cope. And they said, what are you using? And I said, I'm using the Charlotte Mason method. And they're like, the what? <laughs> Charlotte Mason? Uh, uh, here's the book. And they didn't know what I was talking about at all. And they didn't really know about Montessori of just little tables and chairs. They didn't really understand. But absolutely fundamental to getting these, these, these young adults engaged. And also, you know, teaching them with two or three other people as well, because it's A-level classes, it's small groups, up to six, how to get them all engaged, you know, and support the weakest learner. And I truly believe it's important to support the weakest lear learner. Um, we must adapt to support the weakest learner, because then it's good teaching for everybody. A key example of that is the development of the mobile phone. When they developed the mobile phone, there was this thing they thought, oh, we better put it on as an adult, you know, uh, uh, sorry, as an add-on, you know, we we'll just do it as an add-on. So that means that, you know, people who are hearing impaired, they can use the phone as well. And that thing was the text, how to text. It was just an add-on. It was just a tick box so that hearing impaired people could use the phones. Okay, you tell me, what do you use more? Do you use the phone more to speak or to text? you'd probably use it more to text, don't we all? So, you know, this is, and take that principle into your teaching or, and your home and looking at your kids, you support them, you support the weakest thing, then actually it filters out to the strongest thing to everything. So um, that's, that's a really, uh, it was a really good lesson for me in structuring any sort of teaching. Okay, so, Observing Alistair, this is how I, this is, this is sort of the journey that we went on. So my fear was the rejection of learning. I knew uh, for, through my experience with, uh, with my brother and my family, through the things I had read, I knew that if this particularly young boys, particularly young boys, if they get turned off learning, it is much harder to get them turned on again. And I was, I was so scared. So they kept phoning him up. He kept trying to, he was either misbehave and he would misbehave. And then he said, oh, well, you know why I do that? No, why do you do that? Because he was just in the sort of uh, reception uh, class. Why do you do that? Oh, because then I can sit in the corner and just read a book that I want to read. And they've got really great books on volcanoes. Oh, okay. So it's not that he wasn't interested because he wanted a really, a really great book on volcanoes. He just wasn't interested in what they were doing, which he thought was really boring and not relevant to him because he couldn't process it, you know, so that wasn't working. Then when it got too much, he kept trying to uh, run away from school. So they said, well, we've had to put a lock on the gate. Okay, well, he climbed over the gate. And actually what I did was I taught him how to walk home on the path and looking right and left, we weren't too far away from the school so that he, I knew he wouldn't be run over. But um, they, when they phoned up and said, it's a health and safety issue. And I said, no, it's not, it's a frustrated, bored little boy issue. It's not a health and safety issue. It's about him intrinsically. So this was my fear. So observation. So that led me from the why to the how. And what I learnt, what I saw was, what have I got to do? I've got to, um, I, he has extremely uh, slow, uh, poor uh, processing. Um, so his, his, his mental processing is really slow. Once he's got something, it's in there but it needs a lot of reinforcing. So that means I was going to have to support the learning. He was really physical, really, you know, just like a boy. And education isn't great for boys and it's not that great for girls either because they're not using their bodies enough. And when they're little and growing up, actually it's all about their bodies. And it's not just when they're really tiny. I mean, they want to run around. You know, if you've got teenagers, have you ever looked at, my son was learning, he was trying to learn to play, the, he was playing, well, he played the piano very well. And I saw him one day and he was just looking at his hand. I said, why are you looking at your hand? He said, because it's, it's different, it's grown so much. I can't play the piano anymore. I'm having to relearn it. 
So this is one thing. Children have to relearn their physicality through all these growing stages. Now, I am actually quite small, so I didn't have a growing stage. So I had to just take a mental leap to understand what that was like. I never really had a growing spurt, but anyway. But they did. And the shoes build proved it. They really did. And they had to learn about their physicality. So that's really important. And again, if you think about it, too much sitting won't work. You've got to incorporate that in. So that was something. Okay, that's something. And then he's actually really sensitive. He's not wimpy. He's just very sensitive. You know, he can feel somebody's mood, with, you know, before they've even said something. Um, I pick him up after school and he said, oh, have you been to the osteopath? I'm like, how do you know that? Oh, I could just feel you, you feel more relaxed. Oh, okay. I mean, he's really sensitive. So he has to be happy in his own skin. That was something that I had to address. So how am I going to support this? So the extreme, the slow processing skills. For me personally, I felt it was, and this is coming from the SEM point of view, I thought it was really important to have part of our day as structured and to have part of the learning as structured and sequential and a sort of spiral cur curriculum so that we could do really small logical steps that could be mastered. So for his sisters who are dyslexic dyspraxic, they were able to master um, phonics um, quite quickly. But for Alistair, we had to actually, and I did a small training course, actually, um, we actually had to take it down to the, the tiniest trunks and they had to be reiterated um, so many times and you think you get it and it would go so many times. So, um, so I, I really believe that, you know, I'm not prescriptive on, um, you know, child led learning. I think it's, I think it's great. Why not? Uh, I think that's very important. If, you know, your kid, go for it, follow, follow their loves. I think that's, that's fine. But I think for SDN, for all the research that I have learned, the sooner that you intervene, the sooner you build, get these small building blocks going, the better it is. And that doesn't mean killing them with it. Like half an hour in the morning, do it tomorrow, do it the next day, just be consistent and that's it. It, you know, so, so I felt that was really important and from all the research because it gave him the time. The other thing was to make it fun and allow him to make mistakes. And this is something I said about, you know, these older, older young adults that I see and they feel that they're not the right person. Well, that's because they don't know how to make mistakes or they can make mistakes, but they are terrified. They are absolutely terrified. I'm going to talk about one of these people later on. Absolutely terrified to make mistakes. And, um, and I, again, I think this is really sort of part of the, uh, the, the pressure that we're in at the moment. And even if you're out of the education uh, circle, I think if you've got teens on any sort of social media, I think you will have that sort of pressure come through. Um, and so, um, what I have to do, what I did with him, was give him permission to make mistakes. I have to do it to my students all the time. If they have something in and it's not quite right, so many of them say, oh, I'm sorry. No, oh, it's fine, it's really, it's fine, it's not a problem. Okay, let's use that and go from there. With, with Alistair, um, we just used to sit there and, and, and we just used, to, just used to say, it's good to make mistakes it's good to make mistakes you know I just repeat it like a little mantra I made him a little mantra and uh, he now says uh, that's just about the most valuable lesson that he had because as he goes through um, he's using doing music technology and production um, and some composition and he said you know if I didn't make mistakes I'd never learn anything it'd never get better thank goodness I don't mind making mistakes you know I, I'm and he's just so relieved he doesn't have hang-ups about that at all and so he can go faster because he's picking himself up all the time so yeah. oh, somebody's dog <laughs> so, so somebody um so uh, and i think that's really important because it makes him see it's an opportunity so this lighting the fire you know making mistakes this is all part of it getting it wrong is all part of it feeling comfortable in your own skin that you can make mistakes this is an opportunity, that is all part of it. And 
let yourself make a few mistakes. Right, be a little kind to yourself. Okay, it didn't go well, don't do it again. Don't worry, you know, let go a little bit. It's really hard to do, but if you don't role model making mistakes and that it's okay for you, how are they going to learn it? If you put yourself under a lot of pressure to be this, that and the other, then you've taken them out of school, but they might still have that, that model that you don't want them to have. It is so hard. It is really difficult because whatever your backstory is, you've got it in there, you know, and you're going to be probably fighting with your backstory. So be a little kind to yourself. Make some mistakes. Don't know the answer. Use that as an opportunity. It's really important. I use that all the time in my own teaching. And for goodness sake, I have to stand up and I had to write on a whiteboard and I said, oh yeah, I'm dyslexic. So, um, you know, how do you spell that? Well, look it up. <laughs> you know, I, I live this every day, but in, a, in small ways. So make it into that, but, but be kind to yourselves. So, um, and the resources I used, um, I had to decide. So I used things like Orton, Orton Gillingham, um, Montessori Manipulatives, MEP Maths, so I've put the link in the PDF, you'll find it. Um, that taught me uh, toe by toe also, uh, put this down into tiny little tiny bits. But toe by toe was actually quite advanced for us. We actually had to do something far simpler at the beginning. Um, 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 MEP maths was actually um, really important. And I'm going to go on to the next thing, which is the physical. So, you know, the physical gives them the chance to wonder about the world. You know, you don't have to, you know, I told you about my son looking at his hand. Well, he wasn't looking at his hands in frustration. Oh, they won't do what I want them to do anymore. They won't play F whatever major, doodah, doodah scale. I don't do music. Um, you know, he didn't, it was just looking at it in wonder and learning about it. Gosh, you know, my own physicality has changed. And just taking some time and some stock from the lessons he'd learned when he was younger, which was to be physical and wonder about the world, think about it. Now this maths program I did was a revelation to me because it encourages movement in the lessons. So it has a nice little program, it's printed out, you know, um, it does maths as patterns, which I could see fitted very well with what I was trying to do with the language patterns. Um, it gave me a structure, I needed a structure. I needed it to feel confident myself. You know, if you do, if you worry about doing to find something so you feel confident in yourself and so this program did but the the best thing about it was you would do some exercises for a certain number of minutes you know like 15 minutes and then the next thing would be you stand up and you throw a ball and you do some maths fun throwing a ball or doing some catch or doing whatever great it was fantastic it totally broke it up it wasn't a nightmare for either of us you know maths isn't my favorite thing but actually, I really enjoyed the maths lessons. It changed it. That was a really important lesson for me. Um, and what it meant was that I was then brave enough to incorporate movement into all of my lessons. So I could incorporate uh, yoga. Oh, I haven't got the pack here. Um, I don't know if any of you, anyone got those yoga pretzel cards. They're great. And they're this pack of cards. And I used to give them to the children and they would pull a yoga pretzel out and we would do a couple of yoga moves and then we could move on if things are getting, you know, if they're getting bored. I do something quite similar with my students now. They're getting bored. Okay, stand up, move your arms around, sit down again. Just because they're 18 doesn't mean to say they don't need to be physical. You know, an hour and a half lesson, and I do have at A-level hour and a half lessons, you know, they don't, they, they, they've got energy still. So that was really important. For me, welly walks, partly because we had a puppy. Of course we had a puppy, great thing. I'm going to homeschool, I'm going to get a puppy too. Everybody does it, don't they? So anyway, so that was one of them. Welly walks, great. Forest school, there were practically none, but it was so important. So my son, who struggled in the classroom, who struggled even with his small maths and his small English lessons, you get him into the forest, you know what? <laughs> learned to light a fire. Yes, he did. And he made dens and he identified things and he, you know, took class class and he did all these amazing things. 
And in that setting, he found a physical world that he could flourish in. And I think that's really important. And my youngest one, you know what? She struggled, but when she went to ballet, you know, she's not a ballerina, but she went to ballet. It was a different world that she could flourish in. So find them some other physical world that they can really flourish in. It's really important. And then we had the nature tables and so forth. Woodwork. Oh, we made a chicken. Yeah, I've got chickens as well. I've got a puppy. I didn't have enough time, you know, I just had to have chickens as well. So I got, and we made a chicken coop. So, but the kids use the real tools and they learnt about safety and they were so proud of this thing that they made and it was pretty good. And, you know, that was great. And it doesn't have to be a chicken coop. It can be anything, but just doing something that's physical improves all of those, you know, uh, different skills. And for dyspraxia, that's fantastic because it's fine motor skills and coordination skills were great. And then also when we did science, we did it physical and physical geography as well. So, um, so, you know, all of this stuff was really interactive. And then what about the sensitive bit of him? So I, uh, I got a great book um, on uh, teaching values to children. Um, we will all have different values and this isn't a judgment on any values, but this was a useful way for me to teach values um, to the children and it had useful small things that we could do in a practical everyday way to incorporate it. I also had um, empathy resources so young children well and to be fair old children as well <laughs> find it difficult to express themselves and so when we were reading I had empathy cards so that we could hold up the card to say what the mood was of that, you know, you know, what is Peter Rabbit feeling now? What is, you know, uh, what, uh, whichever character feeling now? And their empathy cards to hold it up so we could discuss their response. We had cards to express things. And I, they didn't have to write. I put in stamps. I put in stickers. I put in just colours so they could do all these great things. So give them other channels for those outlets. This really helped with their social skills. I used IT. I used it because it's really forgiving. If you're dyslexic or you've got any of those other issues, you just spend your whole life making mistakes and feeling a bit rubbish about it. Well, you can. I'm trying to not make them. But what's great is one remove from that. And using IT meant you can do things over and over and over again and it doesn't judge you. This says, you know, well done or have another go, you know. And even as a parent, even if you're trying to say, that's fine, just make mistakes. Come on, we're human. We can get a bit frustrating. Oh, oh my, not again. It can be really frustrating. So let the, let the computer take the strain. It can be a very useful tool. I'm not saying just plonk them in front of it, but use it as a tool because it can be your friend. And then the other thing was photographs, actually. So for my oldest one, who is the violinist, um, you know, everyone said, oh, Lydia the violinist has Lydia's music, has her violin. Actually, I just didn't take pictures of her playing the violin. All her pictures of her being, they're, they're pictures of her being everything else. They're pictures of her being all the other things she could be. The, 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 the cake making, the licking the bowl out, getting tangled up, the fairy, the whatever. You know, let them be, let the photograph show them all the different things they can be. So, so that was mine. So actually what I've got is this graphic of all the different things. I don't know if you see, I made a word cloud, which is on the, on the resource of all the different things. It's, I don't know if it shows backwards on here or not, um, that we did. Um, because I just thought, how do I, how do I possibly describe all the things that I used? Um, and it's got on things like, you know, choir and museums and lap books and phonics and violin and Charlotte Mason and singing and yoga and walks and learning to type and, Gosh, so many things, it was great. So that's, that's with the children. So I'm just going to, because I don't want to eat too much, I've only got a couple more things to say about teenagers. How did I use these things to light the fire for teenagers? Because I'm sure some of you've got teenagers. Um, and it's a difficult, it's a difficult one, isn't it, teenagers? It's, it's, um, it is really hard. Um, 
uh, it's very difficult from uh, especially I think homeschooling having been involved and having children who are often sort of willing to do things and joining in and suddenly bang they, they, they sort of stop and I think it can be scary actually and I think that we can feel quite alienated and shut out of their world um, and that that's just as a parent let alone trying to be the teacher parent um, and I do think it's scary and you know as I say the pastoral work I do that's that's the feeling I often get from the parents and they are overcompensating they're, they're worried okay so what do I do so I use these things in much the same way so um, the first thing for me is observation so just take some time to watch them what are they interested in try lots of different things out then adapt I feel like I'm something of a magpie because I use all sorts of different resources and um, I don't say one thing is better than another one thing can be better for one child and one thing better for another child and I think you know I teach in groups I taught a number of ch my children together and differentiation is really important so um, um, so you know respond and then do do it with empathy have some compassion still because they won't show you that they need it but they do they really do they absolutely do inside those teenage years they are absolutely frightened to pieces and it's really important to um to respond and give them that empathy and the other thing as well is, is just you know don't expect much back it's not coming back that's fine Go Goethe said the golden ball never bounces back well it certainly doesn't when they're teenagers but that actually doesn't matter it's just part of the job description okay it's just part of the job description so you just got to go with it and think you're doing your best that's all right give yourself a pat on the back so observe them see what might work you know are they more bookish are they more it-ish are they more physical what's going to work for you adapt keep adapting um charlotte mason i do find that really useful in a formal a-level setting um and i teach history of art as well as english and one of the things when i was talking to juliet about this is the key to lighting the fire when they're older is finding ways of opening doors pushing which door is going to open for them so to get them into a text, it might be that um, reading, it, reading the book, yes, of course, you've got to read it, but that might not be it. It might be that you show them a picture to do with it. It might be that they do an artistic response to it. It might be that they do a recreative response to it. Um, it might be that you play a piece of music from the era or a ballad or something like that. But you, the thing is to adapt and to find what opens the door and be open. And that builds on the Montessori multisensory experience. Just because they're teenagers, it doesn't mean to say they don't want that stimulation still. You know, I, music, pictures, all of these things, I add them to my lessons. Charlotte Mason really worked well for one particular student, uh, Freddie. Um, uh, who had uh, huge psychological problems um, and part of that then he actually couldn't write he just couldn't write he became so scared he just couldn't write anything he could barely even pick up a pen um, uh, he was in an a-level class he could barely pick up a pen he was too scared to commit anything to paper in case it was wrong um, so we used all sorts of things. We used Dragon software, which helped. Or sometimes he dictated to me and I was his amanuensis and wrote the stuff down. And we moved from just, okay, just give me some words. So he would give me some words and I would build a sentence to him thinking of a sentence. And actually in a few weeks, we had paragraphs. And that was a big deal. We had paragraphs from someone who couldn't even pick up a pen because he was too scared to write the word. And that's a combination. It's building things up in small ways, you know, like the Montessori way, like the phonics, like the Charlotte Mason. It was all of those things together. And his parents were great actually at the end and they really didn't expect him to get an A-level, but they were just so thrilled that he was coming to class, he was writing something, he was learning, and he said he was enjoying it. And for them, they just felt that was a massive win. So I had another student much the same. And, you know, actually, he barely ever wrote anything. And then he had to write a personal statement for his UCAS. 
and he wrote all about he wrote about a, a, a place that he, they had visited, an ancient place, and they were completely astonished that he could write with such feeling and sensitivity. And um, for them, that was a massive win. They, and they said, and it was very sweet, and they wrote and they said, it's not that he's been uh, taught things, it's that he's been educated. I thought that was just really lovely. So that's, that's where we have to shed what our expectation or ambition is, because sometimes it's just going to be a little thing. Again, make fun, make, uh, have fun, make mistakes. So there um, might be some questions about teenagers and IT. Very, very quickly, um, uh, like sleep habits, you know, their sleep habits are going to be rubbish when they're teenagers. They're going to sleep at all different times because they're wired to do that. I think that they do that with this, with the computer as well. I think that they grow out of it if you have a light touch with them. Um, uh, one of the things some of my dyslexic students have said to me about gaming is the thing about gaming is you have complete control about what you're doing and they use it as a way of balancing what's happening at school or what's happening in life where you feel like you have no control. And they can go into that space and they can breathe and it's a catharsis for them and they have control. And so, you know, that was really quite a revelation. And so, you know, when my son went through a spot of it, you know, I, I gave him some I gave him some space, whereas my inclination might have been to try and sort of limit it and take it away. But I didn't do that. And then, you know, at the end of it, I think they learned to control it and he doesn't do stuff now. And he says, no, I make it work for me. I uh, you know, I don't work for it, and he has a balance. So I hope that that gives you some um, confidence to light your own fires, to ask your own whys. Um, and um, it's the question time. I'm sorry if I've gone on a bit. I get over enthusiastic. <laughs> that was great, Jenny. Thank you so much. Um, so guys, if you have any questions, if you could just put up your hand in the app, and I'll unmute you, and you can ask your question. Do we have anything? No. Well, that means you must have answered the questions people had very well. Well, I hope so. Um, so I will put the thing up, and I'm quite happy as well to put, um, you know, a list of resources up. Um, so links to some uh, some bits and pieces that I used. You know, if that's useful, if people would like that, um, um, you know, I've got this, I've got this whole stick of stuff that I sort of dug out, and like, oh, here are my resources. I was so happy to go through them. So, you know, if that would be useful, I'm really happy to do that. Okay, so we have Susanna Berry has a question, so I'm just gonna, oh. yep, unmute Susanna. There you go. Hi. Hi, Susanna. Yeah. Hi. Um, I asked the other question on the um, the um the board before when I asked about um kind of you know what you do when you keep trying to light the fire <laughs> and it it never seems to last um and I just I don't know I found a lot of what you said today very useful um but specifically for me my two eldest sons were autistic yeah and so I think I might start badgering you Jenny you no um no, but no, I no, just, that's fine. I, um, I, I it's, I just don't, half the time I don't, I just really don't know where to start. There's just so many things, you know, so I don't know. It's, it's just seemed excessively difficult to spark anything at all I, at I, the moment. Yeah. No, how, so how, how old are they? Are they in their uh, teens? They're four, 14 and 12. So you've got that, that thrown into the mix as well. Yeah, yeah you really <laughs> have, haven't you? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, really what you might be dealing with is 14 and 12, you know, yeah. So, yeah. you know, you might be dealing with that. So a, 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 a colleague of mine said, um, my son went up to his bedroom when he was 13 and he came back downstairs again when he was 18 and he seemed all right <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> and, yeah. and I sort of take heart in that. <laughs> because yeah. It's like, and what I find, I mean, they, they sort of come down to me, you know, I do, I do pop on, knock on the door and just check that they're alive once in a while. Um, but it's, you know, I think it's a really difficult age. So I think um, thinking, um, think outside the, the box. Um, so, you know, what do they like to do in terms of like, is a sort of a physical thing they like to do? Just, I would take it out of the sort of formal realm totally. 
and mm. you know and try and be guided by what's really interesting them at the moment and um you know what they might respond to and and use use that but i think uh, you know asking us the, the why is really important going back to that why you know what you know why am i doing this why what, you know what are we trying to get out of it um is really really important and try and hook them into that as well and into that discussion yeah so i think as well you know something i didn't say one of the things that at the beginning when my son was really little um him him more i suppose than my daughters but you know i was always very clear to them you know why i was doing this and so they under, they understood they were part of the narrative and so they were part of the discussion and we still have those discussions. And actually when I was writing this, you know, I was still, I was talking to them about it and getting some good input, possibly some scary input. Um, <laughs> that's always the worst, it makes me back from young kids. But, um, but keeping them part of that discussion. And um, I think everything when they're teenagers, you know, it's with kid gloves. I have to say that with my my oldest, um, who um, you know she has some nonverbal learning difficulties on top of her musicality and dyspraxia and all the rest of it. Um, you know, you just say hello. What do you mean? Uh, just meant hello. <laughs> you know, and it's really scary. Do you know what I love? I love emojis. They're great. <laughs> They're really great. <laughs> hello. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, and they saved my life and possibly our relationship. Um, and talking to kids the way they like to talk helps as well. So if it's really not working face to face, do you know what? I send them a text. It sounds really crap. It sounds really callous and cold, but that's how they talk to each other. And you've got to get, you know, with, with teens, what I've learned is, you, you know, you've got to get in with what they're doing at the moment. Hello, little chap. But, you know, you've got to get in there with what they're doing at the moment. And so, although I'm constantly being called a boomer, um, you know, it doesn't matter because I'm sort of part way there. You know, I'm not all the way there because that'd be embarrassing, but I'm enough there. So texting really, really helps with the discussion. Emojis, oh, they do really help. Light handling and following some passions that possibly for a while just forget the formal stuff. Just forget all of it to say, just not working all I'm doing is building up that resistance like my son at school what are they doing instead are they reading the equivalent of a volcano book what are they doing use that so that's 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 what I would say and be kind to yourself you know be really kind to yourself because I'm sure you're doing a good job and I'm sure you really care and I, and I think it's really easy to be hard on yourself. So be kind to yourself. And if you really do want to get in touch, that's fine. You can you can get in touch. So that's kind of, great, isn't it? We, we shouldn't discount the small victories at times, especially with teenagers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions? Any more raised hands? I don't think so. I think you've done a sterling job at answering people's questions. Well, Thank you, everybody. That ends the session for today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at your next session. Take care. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.